Now, to be clear, this isn't just a failure of the Biden administration, what we're about to talk about. It's also a failure of those who delayed aid in the first place. It's also a failure of those who didn't think that it was a priority and thought that it could be delayed endlessly. It's also a failure of those who uh, are being reconciliatory about the idea uh, that it's, you know, it's, oh, you know, we're spending too much on the Ukraine. Who cares about the Ukraine? Uh, ain't including people like Pramia Jayapal from her recent statements online. Anyway, the main fault, though, as much as I might try to find some way to divvy it up amongst the others, uh, falls ultimately at the Biden administration and the decisions that they made with what to do with the PDA and the what they've been authorized to send over to Ukraine by Congress. So, there's only two, mo two more months until Biden's out of office. Biden's going to be out and honestly, actually less than two months. And so the about six to seven billion dollars that is left to send over to Ukraine needs to be sent over before January 20th, because if it's still there come January 20th, it will be President Donald J. Trump deciding what happens to the rest of the aid that has already been congressionally approved, mind you. Mind you, this isn't new aid. This is an aid that has been magically approved or like, or some like magic math that Biden did to manifest this. This has been congressionally approved, but the president also has discretion on how it is used. Therefore, if Donald Trump wanted to hold it back, he kind of could. Or if he wanted to, for example, send stuff that is not as needed, he could do that, but presumably he would just not send anything. Now, it didn't need to be this way. It wasn't like we just found out that Zelensky and gang uh, were facing, you know, a struggle for survival and that Donald Trump could be the next president of the United States. To put, make a long story short, and so we don't have to read all of this article, what has essentially happened is that we've waited so long that... White House officials don't believe it is possible to get all the aid to Ukraine on time, meaning that there will be a certain amount of aid that is not sent over in time, and that will be likely held up by the next administration. Now, if we were started sending increased amounts of aid months and months and months in advance, w with the priority of making it so that when January 20th comes around, there's nothing left in the stocks so no matter which outcome comes out of the election, Ukraine will have the aid that was approved. That did not happen, though. That's not what the Biden administration did. That's not what they did. And now they're trying to rush aid out the door. And the problem is that some of the stuff that could be sent over, like armored vehicles, like if they wanted to send over a whole new set of Bradleys, it takes time to test them, to examine them, and to make sure they're up to snuff and then supply them before sending them over. And it would take so much time that it would likely not be sent over in time. And while it was still being prepared, Donald Trump would be sworn in. Meaning that what they're likely going to do is concentrate largely on artillery shells, munitions, and artillery systems. And the reason is, is it's just much easier to pack and much easier to send over and you can do it in a much larger quantity. And so they're going to be focusing on the stuff that is most needed, and they know they're gonna need like artillery shells and artillery, and are easiest and quickest to pack. With the rate that they're uh, imagining getting over to Ukraine every month, being at the upper echelons of about $750 million worth of aid every month. And at that rate, with how much that is left over, yeah, no, there's probably going to be a billion dollars or two left over when it's all said and done. And a billion dollars, two billion dollars, that's a lot of money. That, that can be a, a fair bit of shells. But they simply don't have enough shells to send them all over right now without reducing America's military readiness, which the Pentagon, for the entirety of this war, has refused to do it is going to refuse to do it again here. Meaning that we do have other shells that we could send. Uh, the Biden administration could push the Pentagon 
to, ha to have a temporary reduction in military readiness. To try to get these shows over there under the timeline we have, because sometimes seizing the moment is what's important. I don't think they're going to do that, though. I don't think, considering how much experience Biden has and how much he's been in Washington, that he's going to make a decision like that to try to seize the moment. Either way, the Biden administration is now trying to rush through aid as quickly as possible. You know, we block aid for six months, unblock aid, send some of it, and then when we find out, oh, wait, the next administration might not be so friendly to this, now we start to kick it up. Even though we knew months ago that Trump might be the next president of the United States. Okay, so this, a little aggravating, and I would say that it is a failure of the administration not to organize it being sent before the inauguration of the next president. And I don't care what people say, America is quite renowned for its logistics. If we really tried and concentrated on it after we passed the aid, I think we could have sent it in time. Okay, that's the first thing. I wanted to also read one more thing, and it comes from the article, and we have to read it. And this infuriated me so much. Honestly, out of all of the Biden decisions that has been made, this is the one that probably angers me the most. And that's saying quite a, that's saying quite a lot, what I'm about to read you. Because, you know, obviously the worst of the worst was the six-month period where aid was not being sent over. Because you cannot say you're going to support an ally and then stop sending the aid during crucial battles where they're fighting for their most defensible defensive positions when people are dying. Like that, to me, that is morally repugnant to a level that is unforgivable. But definitely for the politically partisan reasons it was done for. But that was not completely in Joe Biden's control because there was a Republican House that was stopping it led by Mike Johnson. This, though, was a decision that was within his control. Let me read you uh, what Biden's doing to try to get them in a better position and what he didn't do early on. Okay, here we go. Oh, for example, uh, they just decided to start sending over anti-personnel landmines because, anti because landmines have been extremely helpful in this war, uh, both in damaging resupply, uh, killing advancing troops, slowing down enemy armies, giving complications for enemy sappers. Um, I mean, it is it is something that has helped supplement the defenses of both lines tremendously. With some like units, like forty to forty five percent of their drone missions are just mining behind enemy lines. And so, while there are moral objections people could make, uh, no one can make the tactical objection. Um, that's one thing Biden has done. Where is the thing that I'm looking for? Here it is. Biden's fear of escalation with Russia has also factored heavily into his decisions to limit the weaponry provided to Kiev. That fear has often been bolstered by U.S. intelligence agencies. Analysts concluded that the powerful attackums, for example, might goad Putin into dramatic response. Goad, according to two senior administration officials, Biden ultimately allowed attackums to be used inside Russia after North Korea sent troops to aid Moscow hoping to send Pyongyang a message that it risks suffering significant casualties. It was not the first time he had hesitated to upgrade Kiev's firepower. Biden initially hesitated to provide M1 Abrams tanks, concerned that they would be too logistically burdensome for Ukrainian troops. Amid urgent pleas for the Ukrainian President Zelensky, Biden ultimately agreed to provide the tanks in January of 2023. Similarly, Biden initially concluded that Ukraine did not need F-16 fighter jets, but in May of 2023, the president relented, paving the way for Kiev to receive the plane. Biden's aides say the president has shown appropriate caution, given the unpalatable risk of nuclear conflict, and say that his decisions have been driven far more by policy than fear of escalation. The aides downplay the notion that providing the weapons earlier would have significantly altered the course of the war. Um, for me... I think that the attackums long-range strike capability, if we're going to give it to them in 2023, it should have been given before the counteroffensive. How are you going to say that the Ukrainians need to be conducting large-scale counteroffensives against well-fortified Russian positions that they've had time to prepare because of the delay in aid to the Ukrainians? How are we going to say that they're going to need to do that 
but they cannot use long range strike capability to take out the logistics supply lines and air bases from which their advancing troops would be attacked by. For example, constantly harassed by Russian helicopters, which once they got attack during the tail end of the counteroffensive, they fired it at those air bases that they were being used in, and then the helicopter attacks decreased towards the end of the offensive after they had done the vast majority of the damage, but it gives you an idea. Of course, I'm not saying any one weapon would change the landscape, I'm just saying that I can think of plenty of scenarios. For example, if, if there was permission to strike into Russia six, seven months ago, then maybe the Ukrainians could have taken Glushkovo by further damaging Russian logistics and resupply into Kursk. And that would be a much more defensible position than where the Ukrainians are having to fight right now. Anyway, continuing to the point that angered me about Biden, the big one. Here it is. In September of 2022, when Ukraine was far exceeding expectations on the battlefield, Washington had intelligence that the Kremlin was contemplating the use of nuclear weapons, according to three people familiar with the situation who spoke of the condition of anonymity to discuss confidential information. Those intelligence reports were a backdrop for a decision by Biden a few months later to reject a proposal from Secretary of State Antony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. In a meeting in the Oval Office, Blinken and Sullivan suggested warning Russia that if it did not stop shooting missiles and drones at civilian targets, the United States would provide Ukraine with attackers. Biden resisted, worried about how Russia would react, and he only relented partially nearly a year later, after the 2023 counteroffensive, mind you, when he had agreed to provide Ukraine with medium-range attackums in the fall of 2023, the longer-range attackums came even later in the spring of 2024. And the permission to strike into Russia came after that. I remember when there was the Russian strike on the children's cancer ward in Kiev. I said if there was ever a moment for where the Biden administration would escalate based upon the defense of civilians and trying to deter future attacks on civilians, it was that moment. It was that moment when the Russians fired a, misser, a missile, hit the cancer ward, heavily damaged it, and didn't take out any military installation. It was something that horrified the entire nation, something that disgusted the entire nation, something that discussed the entire world, and we had no response. If you want to make it, so th this is the problem I have. We want to both not provide Ukraine with enough air defense to protect its airspace, while also holding back the Ukrainians from making the long range strikes necessary to take out the archer that is shooting the arrow. If you can't shoot down the arrow, then you gotta take out the archer. And if the archer is taking shot after shot in crowded civilian areas, including children's cancer hospitals, to the point where I go around and I interview people in medical centers, and I can't even say what the location was, I'll just say medical centers, uh, and they'll tell me, please do not allow our information to go out. Civilian hospital, mind you, treating civilians, because they're worried that their hospital's gonna get hit with a caliber missile. That shouldn't be the case. Russia has a record of doing this. They hit four hospitals in 12 hours in Syria. Much of it documented. There's reporting on it online if you want to look into it. There's just no, if there was any point to do it, it was then. And by putting the ball in Russia's court by saying, look, we don't want to do this, but if you keep bombing apartment blocks and you don't limit your strikes to military targets, then we will allow the Ukrainians the long range capabilities. Mind you, it's not even a question of give the Ukraine long range missiles to strike into Russia. This was a question of give the Ukrainian long range missiles as a deterrence response to the striking on civilian infrastructure. And that was rejected. But here we are, not only the shorter range attackums, the longer range attackums, and now they're being fired into Russia with two months to go in the administration. No, less than two months to go in the administration. Jake Sullivan was right. Anthony Blinken was right. They were suggesting it. And it wasn't Jake Sullivan. It wasn't Lloyd Austin, even though he'll be there, of course, to emphasize the supply restraints. 
It wasn't Anthony Blinken. It was Joe Biden, his hesitancy, and him holding back the administration that held those long-range missiles for so long that could have been used in the 2023 counteroffensive. And ma imagine if the counteroffensive didn't have to be down south either. Imagine if there were permissions for it to be like Kursk and they did it in Dubryansk. And they had more land to leverage off of. And then the Russians, instead of attacking harder into the Donetsk region that year, they would have attacked harder into that region. Who knows? It's impossible. And I'm not going to say one weapons capability here or one's weapons capability there would have drastically changed the war in every way. But the person with more tools in the tool belt has an advantage. And the sooner you have those tools, then the longer you can leverage said advantage. And it was held back in a instance where it could have been used, in my mind, morally to both defend Ukrainian cities and help them prosecute the war. Instead, we waited until it was the North Koreans a year and a half later. Drip, drip, drip. Drip, drip, drip. The drip never stops. Drip feed, drip feed, drip feed. Drip feed, drip feed, drip feed. Okay. Okay.